Um, you mute might hear a little. Oh, there we go. Ellen is connecting. Amazing. Ellen, yay. Um, so yeah, I know I gave a little bit of background on what we're doing, who we are, but um, yeah, we're South Central Brooklyn United for Progress, um, pushing for progressive policy change uh, in our communities and looking for transparency from elect elected officials. And uh, one of the things we advocate for is more connection between people and our legislatures, legislators. Um, so yeah, that's why you're here. We just wanna hear from you and uh, we'll share out your message to our community. Um, so if you could just kick us off by giving a little bit of background on who you are and why you're running. Terrific. And I won't pretend to cover everything. I'll try to keep it a little bit shorter so that we can go wherever you want with the questions. Uh, cool. And I just appreciate you being here late in the evening and the time has changed and adjusted. As you can tell, things have adjusted in my life too. I'm in a basement right now. This is not like a cool hip office we have set up. I My kids are in bedtime. So being down here is allows me to be more animated while they're all settling still. So forgive me for being in a basement. Uh, my name is Justin Krebs. I'm running for city council in the 39th district. For 20 years, I've been a progressive political organizer in New York, doing city, state, federal organizing advocacy, work often at the intersection of politics and culture, open spaces, civic participation, small businesses, and for the last six years, I've run the campaign's team at Move On. So MoveOn.org, the big national progressive campaign. And we work on impeachment. We work on immigration. We work on taxes. We work on health care. We work on gun violence. We work on reproductive justice. And I act as a air traffic controller among the different campaign directors at any given time. So we get to work mobilizing our millions of members around the country for progressive change. At the same time, locally, most of my efforts have been thrown into where I find myself at the start and end of every day are local schools. I have three daughters who are in third grade, first grade, and first grade. Yes, the younger two are twins at PS39 on 6th Avenue in Park Slope. And the school is the heartbeat of our uh, family and our community. It's a heart that's not beating the right normal way right now, thanks to the pandemic and can be doing a lot better. But not only has that given me a chance to engage as a parent in the school and as a parent leader in PS39, but as a parent leader in District 15, which is the school district that overlaps with City Council District 39, as well as into a couple other districts a little bit. Uh, and that means that I get to work with parent leaders all around the district, understanding the issues that are going on in schools that are facing the parent community, that are facing students, and thinking about how we share information, share resources, build social capital with each other. And that's the kind of work I love doing, bringing folks together to build social capital, to, uh, to create things that are bigger than ourselves. It's the kind of work that I do at Move On. It's the kind of work I do in parent organizing. It's the kind of work I do as a founder of a theater 18 years ago called The Tank, which is in Manhattan, does more new work by emerging artists than any other venue in New York City. And it was born out of a group of volunteers creating it, but grew into an arts organization. Again, by working together, but also in the course of that, giving me the opportunity to see the city as a small business owner as someone who started and ran a nonprofit, a community center. And I think those are great skills because all six candidates in this race are legitimate, viable candidates with real connections to the community. So I think you wanna say, one, what are city council members focused on? And two, what are the skill sets they bring? And my focuses are gonna be schools, are revitalizing our main streets. So small business, uh, safe streets for pedestrians, cyclists, uh, open space, culture, all the things that make our neighborhoods come to life, climate, and all of that in the landscape of an equitable COVID recovery. And the skills I bring are having led and run organizations. That means managing people, managing budgets, making decisions, thinking about how to navigate organizational growth and how to really get things done. That's the skill set matched with the big campaigning, matched with the parental focus that I want to bring to city council. And with that, happy to chat more about whatever interests you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that intro. So yeah, we'll open it up. I'll see if Nora and Ellen have any questions. I have some questions if not. Um, but yeah, you're, uh, thank you again for filling out the candidate questionnaire. There's a lot in there that we can chat further about if um, Ellen and Nora don't have questions immediately. You have one, Ellen, go for it. Um, yeah, so listening to you just raise the question with me, what made you decide to go from 
um, progressive organizations and community organizations to uh, run for political office. It's, you know, a pretty different um, ball of wax. Right. Thanks, Ellen. Uh, so a couple answers to that. One is that we're at a point in our life as a family where it's very clear this is going to be our home forever. You know, we lived on Hoyt Street, which is technically in the 33rd, and then the last nine years we've been here on 8th Street. My three kids now go to the same school. Uh, when I started running pre-COVID, my wife, Casey, had her small business here in the district. She's a midwife and a birth educator, and her business uh, would bring people together to learn about what to expect in labor. If you want to imagine a group of people who do not get together in person right now, it is seven expectant parents and their partners in a garden apartment for seven hours at a time. So her business is now virtual. But when we started running, it was a business that was here serving a clientele that was largely based in Brooklyn. Our kids were in the schools here. My uh, additional political life beyond the work at Move On was increasingly here. And this felt like the right way of bringing the campaigning and the advocacy that I've been doing at Move On, which I think is part of a city council member's job is to be not just a legislator, but be an advocate and combine it with the hyper locality of the life we're living right now. And also that's a lot of my work predating Move On. So building a theater in New York City, building social communities in New York City, working in parks and open space in New York City was a lot of the more local focus. The, uh, you know, when I started my career, I didn't know it was gonna be my career necessarily. I started working as a constituent affairs liaison in Senator Clinton's office when she first got elected. I worked on the 2000 campaign, I worked in her office. And so that, since then I have had this commitment and this somewhat naive belief that government can work and that it's up to all of us to elect people who make it work, but that the levers of governmental power are really our levers to bring our shared interests our shared energy to grab those levers together, pool our resources for the common good. And whether that's physical commons, schools, parks, cultural centers, or um, uh, social commons or digital commons or, or uh, theoretical commons, the, the shared resources we, 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 we work for and thrive on are all provided by a government that is responsive to and working in partnership with community groups. So I, I do see these as, as uh, a married set of work um, the politics and the government working together. I hope that answered your question. Yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Nora, any questions from you or should I turn to my list? Not to put you yeah. on the spot. No, go ahead. Please, uh, okay. please turn to your list. Sure. So I um, would love to hear more about kind of the, so you have the tank, um, organization that kind of works at the intersection of performing arts and public policy. And, you know, right now it is not no secret that COVID has really impacted the art space in Brooklyn and in your district. And I would love to see kind of what, learn more about your plans for revitalizing the arts in your district moving forward post COVID. Post COVID, sure. The, so the, the plan for revitalizing arts in our district is tied in with a plan for revitalizing, revitalizing arts citywide. I don't know that it's, um, it's totally separate. And it, it's based on a couple of things. One is, um, well, I guess there's a set of, of priorities or principles I take to it. So one, recognizing that as with so many stories in New York, the ability to create arts is in part a real estate story. Do you have space to do it? That's what the tank has, was founded on as this kind of non-commercial collaborative entity. The city has access to, or the ability to create access to space in a lot of forms, um, outdoor space, public space, incentivizing space to be used, working with landlords to create programs that house nonprofits. This doesn't only work for the arts, by the way, it works for a lot of different nonprofit social organizations, could work for entre entrepreneurial endeavors. There's space that we can access in Marshall and there's probably even more of it given how much space is not occupied in the way it was last February. So I think one area to look at is space. Second area to look at is the people who are in the space. Uh, artists, especially you know, professional artists, people in theater, people in music, people in the gig economy have been hit extraordinarily hard. So while there's a little bit more hope from the federal government than there was 
12 days ago or however many days ago the inauguration was, uh, the state and the city need to also keep working to, to create the programs that fill those in. There are plenty of folks who because of their employment status, their documented status are gonna fall through um, the gaps in the funding that's coming down. We wanna think about how to keep those folks as well as folks who work in restaurants, cafes and so forth. People were saying, you can't go to your job right now. How do you keep them in their homes? How do you uh, ensure that they're getting unemployment benefits or other benefits, that they have food security and that they're able to come back to work afterwards? And then what I would really love to see from city and state partnerships is really an ambitious and creative vision of what happens if we do put these artists to work. Artists and creators are currently, many of them, not all of them, but many of them are underemployed. So there's some great ideas like Actors' Equity came out and said, put our, put our or they, they and the stagehands came out and said, put us to work building and staffing vaccination centers, right? Like it's not an arts thing, but it's kind of putting on a show. You got to put it on the production. You got to figure out how to do all this. And I do think, you know, and I, I think of this with educators all the time. The first, last, and most frequent thing I talk about is schools because it's where my kids are. How can you have at the same time in the city, a shortage of teachers and an abundance of creative, engaged people who want to share their love of creation with the world, right? I, I get that there are resource issues and I get that there are contractual issues, but they're like, where is the surge emergency teaching core that's made up for one year certification, one year program for people in a high speed certification to give artists a place to work? And I, I'm using artists in the broad sense, writers, um, creators, illustrators, performers of all sorts. So I would love that kind of big thinking. And then the last thing, and this, this holds true for many industries, is you, you talk to the people who are impacted. So don't just guess what artists want, but actually talk to them. And obviously I talk to a lot of artists and producers and presenters and theater owners and really tapping into their insights and their energy about what they need, what keeps them here. There are a lot of great band-aid solutions that are going on and we need to support those and invest in those and social capital can make those work. We also need some systemic solutions and our city's not going to feel itself either um, spiritually or economically until arts and theater are are back in business. So we have to make those happen. Got it, thank you. Uh, Thanks, Allison. And yeah, an, another question around, kind of building a bit on Ellen's question um, on the move from kind of grassroots activism to an elected role. Is there anything that you would bring from your time at Move On to your role as a city council member in terms of kind of igniting public engagement with politics locally? That's a great question, Allison. And you know why? Because I often get asked like this negative version of that, like, what do you know about this? You work at Move On. And I like this kind of calling in rather than calling out, what would you bring? So I wonder if I'm going to mention things. Uh, Ellen, before you got on the call, Allison mentioned that she had done a Move On training program four summers ago. And so I wonder if some of these will sound familiar. So one thing that I, I definitely reference is that Move On has what we call a culture of big ears. We have millions and millions of members. How do we listen to them? We don't get on the phone. We don't necessarily invite them all into a room for a meeting. How do you use a lot of different techniques at once, synchronously, to listen to folks in different ways? How do you make sure you have big ears? So you're testing things that they're responding to. You're giving them options to, to, to email in. You're doing calls. You're doing social media feedback. You're connecting with folks in a lot of different ways to take the temperature of where they are. Now, that's millions and millions of folks around the country. But I think the principle that I would take into elected office is how do you manifest that? So instead of choosing between, you know, imagine the pandemic's over, it will be over at some point, and you're faced with a choice, do we keep having Zoom meetings or do we go back to in-person meetings? Well, have, have both, right? Some are gonna work well for some and some are gonna work well for the others. How do you have language access and language justice at these meetings? How do you have meetings at times that working people can go to? How do you have times, uh, meetings at times that working parents can go to? You, how do you have, engagement for somebody who can never spend two hours going to the public meeting. So that concept of big ears that you use a lot of different tools to listen, some of which are digital, but they can't all be digital, um, would be one thing that I would bring with me. Another thing that I would think about, you know, about 19 years ago, I had the chance to write, I, I worked for an organization called New Yorkers for Parks at the time. 
and I had the chance to write a history of New York City's playgrounds, which was like a really cool project for a 23 or four year old to do. The key moment of discovery as we were putting together this project was that the history of playgrounds was not a history of the physical spaces. It was a history of the advocacy, a history of the people who made the playgrounds. Playgrounds, like safe streets, like integrated schools, like um, arts and culture, don't happen by fiat in our city. They don't happen by accident. They don't happen uh, because an administrator, I mean, Nora maybe will tell me differently from OMB, but I don't think they happen because someone says, we need these things. They happen because concerned advocates from the community are arguing for it, all, often leading the way to create it. And then you have inside allies in the city council or in city government who understand how to work with the, the community groups. And that's how playgrounds were created here. And that's a principle I would take into city council, which is how do you empower the advocates, which is what I do on a regular basis at Move On and Move On, in addition to empowering our own members, often partners with other organizations. So if we're doing immigration work, we follow the lead of United We Dream or the National Domestic Workers Alliance. If we're doing racial justice work, we follow the movement for black lives or color of change. How do you take that into city council and say, who are the advocates, national, local, community, citywide, who are doing the work that I can now be the strong inside partner and ally to. And that, so th those, are, those are a couple of things that I take from the move on world. All right, very cool. Uh, Ellen, go, uh, you have a question, I think. Yeah, I have another question. Um, so District 39 is a really diverse district with a lot of different cultures and uh, language groups. And it's very different from the north end to the south end of the district. And I wonder if you could talk about how you would go about representing the different needs of the different parts of the district. Absolutely. Before uh, you jump in, Justin, just a time I'll keep it short. check warning. I appreciate it. And that's a great question. We could talk about it for It's hours. a great question. I see the timer telling me. So yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are a couple couple things that I would I would commit to and a couple things that I would kind of hold as the principles of this. So one is in all advocacy work you do, and I think in the city council will be the same, you think about the folks who are most impacted by any given issue. And so when you're talking about schools, um, you don't just talk about PS39 where my kids are, but you think about how you talk to the parent leaders, the administrators, the teachers at the schools that are hit, hit hardest, whether that's by budget cuts, by COVID, by um, uh, whatever else the, the issues are. And that's like the kind of way I've approached the District 15 President's Council where I'm on the executive board of that and get to work and support the president who was at PS15, which is in Red Hook and work with folks who are in Sunset Park, as well as in the heart of Park Slope, as well as in Kensington, as well as in Cobble Hill. So uh, some of it is making sure you're connected to, listening to, surrounded by the folks who represent the different parts of the district to tie back to the big years, which is like, the more you say big years, the funnier it sounds. Um, but I, I would say like, you have to be able to engage communities across languages and there are, um, many, many languages spoken in our district, but there are three or four that are spoken very in, 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 dense, in density in different areas of the district. And you need to make sure you have folks in your office that can speak that language. You need to make sure your office communications are going out in multiple languages. Um, and again, it's that can't just be over email, not everyone's gonna be over email. So, so that would be part of it too. And then the last thing that I would say is I would use the experience that I've had both at Move On and the Tank and elsewhere in terms of thinking about how to use my platform to elevate the voices of others. And that's a little bit of what I was saying about how Move On tries to act in coalition. It's a little bit of what the tank has tried to do um, in our approach to how we co-present and who we co-present. But I would really make a point of thinking about city council not being my podium, but being a platform that I'm helping build and who else can share that platform with me. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Justin. That about wraps it up. Really appreciate you chatting with us late on a Wednesday. Um, but yeah, we're looking forward to, you know, we'll invite you to um, our February meeting. I don't think that date is set yet, but- It's the 21st. Um, oh, okay. it is set. It. Great. We said it's not tentative anymore. Two weeks from tomorrow. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, we'll send you some info about that um, and we'll share your, this, uh, video session, interview session um, with our group, as well as your questionnaire. And yeah, see if anyone else has any questions for you. Great. And the last thing I'll say is for, 
I mean, anyone's welcome to check out justin2021.org and learn more about me. But more importantly, they could also email info at justin2021.org with any questions, with any follow-up, with any ideas. Um, Aziz, who you met briefly before my campaign manager, I will follow up with everybody that emails info at justin2021.org. And I think that's, this is a, a piece of, uh, tied in with what you're asking, I, I can't pretend to be the expert on everything. I do not know the answer to everything. Fortunately, all of you do. Not just the three of you, but literally the people who are gonna ask the questions will often have the insights and the answers that I learn from. So whether that's when I meet with labor groups, when I meet with good government groups, when I meet with small business owners, when I meet with parents from different schools, I'm not telling them the answer. I'm trying to learn from them as well, learn and listen. And, and that's what I'd love to do with any of your members who have experiences, expertise, insights, questions to share. Uh, I can commit to being someone who will listen, who will learn, who will engage and will try to be better for it. Great, well, Great. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think that wraps us up. So we'll, we'll be in touch. I appreciate the time tonight. Enjoy your evening. I'll talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good Thank night. You. Good night.